welcome to Essex Wildlife Trust's Wilder Communities Programme. This is the pond creation webinar for our Preserve Ponds topic. Um, it's actually our first webinar of 2023 for our Team Wilder projects, which includes the Urban Wildlife Champions, Wilder Towns, Wild Villages and Next Door Nature. So you, if you've come in um, and you're part of one of those, welcome, great to see you. Uh, there's a few familiar names on the screen here I can see. Um, but just in case you don't know me or you haven't met me, um, then uh, my name is Danielle Carbot. I'm the Wilder Communities Manager at Essex Wildlife Trust and lead on everything Team Wilder based. So you'll be seeing me throughout the various different workshops and webinars through the year. Uh, before we kick off, as I've mentioned, um, this is being recorded. It's a webinar, so you will not be able to turn your camera on or your microphone on, and you can hide your name as well if you do not want that to appear. Um, if you have any questions, there is a chat function. Uh, there's a bubble just at the top of your screen there. Um, if you've got questions throughout, pop it in there, um, and I will try and answer them at the end. Session one, as I've said this evening, is in the preserve ponds topic and we'll be focusing, focusing specifically on pond creation, something I know many of you are looking to create or manage in your own garden or community garden. First, um, I just wanted to start with an overview of ponds and I think this graphic from Freshwater Habitat provides a great overview of where we currently are when it comes to the state of ponds in the UK. Ponds are uh, water bodies between one square metre and about two hectares, so 2.5 football pitches uh, for those trying to visualise in, in your head, um, any bigger and it becomes a lake. So ponds tend to be a fairly tricky topic um, simply because each one is different. Some may be permanent and others may be seasonal. Um, and, but the, the general rule is that if it holds water for four months or more in the year, then it is classified as a pond. Um, and I'm sure lots of you experienced during the really hot summer months in 2022, lots of our ponds drying out. Um, this can be a very scary situation, something not to look forward to. But as long as it is full and it bounces back in those winter months, it can still be classified as a pond. And actually some of those new habitats um, from the fluctuating uh, heights of the water can be really, really valuable. But as the graphic shows, ponds support two thirds of all freshwater species, highlighting just how important they are. But we have lost 50% of them in the 20th century and 80% of those are still remaining are in, poor, in a poor state. So we really do need more people bringing ponds to their environment. And although we aren't focusing on those bigger pond projects this evening, um, garden ponds and ponds in allotments or community gardens uh, can be just as valuable. They are a lifeline and have the potential to link fragmented wildlife communities and ultimately increase habitat available for our freshwater wildlife. For this session, I am going to go through practicalities, a step by step guide on how to create a pond for beginners. Often this bit is a, a left out when talking about ponds, but I thought it would be a really good idea just to go through those practical steps and what it what it actually looks like in the real world. So step one, mark your pond. Depending on where you're looking to place your pond, the shape and the depth are really quite important. Smaller ponds do not need to be deeper than half a metre, particularly if you're planning on using a liner. Often we sort of imagine ponds as being, you know, quite deep, um, filled with lots and lots of water with no shallow edges. But actually for your garden ponds, your allotment ponds, those in community spaces, smaller ponds that are quite shallow are fantastic resources. And you want to try and create natural wiggly shapes. Uh, they're often better than a more sort of formal circle, as this creates more edge where marginal vegetation is. Most species actually live in these areas, around those edges, around those kind of margin areas where it's slightly shallow. Relatively few actually live in the open water itself. Also ensure you're not digging a pond in an already thriving habitat like a species rich grassland or in an area where animals are already breeding and nesting. 
If you do need any advice on where to uh, place your plond, please contact me via my email. We can talk about it over the phone, online, or you can send me pictures through of your potential site. More than happy to give advice around that. So that was step one, mark your pond. Step two, dig your pond. As mentioned, you don't want to dig deeper than half a metre. And actually, about sort of 25 to 30 centimetres is a great way um, to keep your pond well oxygenated. Um, that means it's quite shallow and you're not getting um, issues around kind of silt buildup, easier to manage, and as I said, create better habitats. Um, it's also useful to create sort of varying depths and sloping edges, um, as I mentioned, for the marginal vegetation. The more diversity you have, the more diversity in species you're going to welcome. Avoid digging very deep, as I've said, as this will create those sort of steep sides. And that actually means that other species can't get in and out of the pond. Um, sloping and shallow sides are really, really vital. So when you're marking out your pond and then digging it, really think about how big you want it and where the kind of shallower and sort of more deeper parts might go. When digging your pond out as well, try and keep some of the soil and turf um, that you take out as this can be used to secure liners around the edge in the next few steps. Um, and as the pictures show, this can be a very muddy exercise. So make sure you're wearing the appropriate clothing. Um, I had to put the, what, the picture in the, in the right on because, yeah, just demonstrates that if you do choose a slightly rainy, uh, more miserable day, it can be a bit of a task. OK, so step three, check the level. Once you've dug out that pond and you're you're happy with the shape, you're happy with the depth, then have a look um, at whether your pond is level. And that's really important because otherwise, if you are using a liner and you fill it up with water and it's not level, there will be bare liner showing. So the best way to do this is to use a spirit level. Um, and a long piece of wood. So there's a couple of pictures there for you. So you can place that wood across your pond and then put the uh, leveller on top. And this can help you check uh, whether your pond is level. And you can change it and adapt it um, and as you see fit. And I think these examples are really great. You've got sort of two garden ponds uh, being created there. And it really gives you uh, an idea of, of how to do that, how to check that your pond is level. Step four, lay the liner. If you are using a liner, uh, make sure that there are no stones or other materials that will puncture the liner as you lay it. This can be a little bit tricky, especially if you're going for a slightly larger pond. You can actually also cushion the liner with a layer of sand or extra padding underneath. Um, and then, of course, ultimately hold it down with that leftover turf that I mentioned earlier. And the picture on the right there is a good example of this, where they've used that turf that they've lifted up just to secure the liner around the edges where the sort of terrestrial part of the pond will be, the bit where, where there will be no water, just moving into that sort of marginal vegetation area. Um, and then uh, a good idea once you've popped that liner down is to possibly add some other substrate to it, uh, maybe sand on top or other pebbles. You can see there on the right that they've used some bricks, but I would definitely suggest sort of smaller pebbles or sand. Um, this can help hold the liner down, but it can also add uh, further diversity to the habitat uh, for the aquatic species. Um, at this point as well, I often get asked what sort of liners should be used. And there are some choices and it is a little bit of a minefield. Um, freshwater habitat, uh, which I have mentioned earlier, uh, have some wonderful suggestions. So I do recommend checking out their website, but I'll just go through some of those options now. Um, similarly to the pictures on here, most people use synthetic flexible liners, which are fairly affordable and perfect for smaller garden uh, ponds. Rubber liners uh, tend to be more durable than um, PVC, and it is advisable, as mentioned, to underlay with protection such as sand or further padding material, just so you don't puncture it. They're very difficult to repair if they do uh, tear or get holes in. Um, so, yeah, it's something to think about when you're creating that pond, how you protect that uh, synthetic liner. 
You can, however, also use something called puddled clay. Uh, this is a natural substrate, so extra beneficial to wildlife. Um, and, you know, for those people who are trying to avoid plastic, uh, could be a good option. And with uh, puddled clay, it can also be easily repaired as well. So if there are sort of gaps or holes, um, it's you know very easy to get in there and, and add some clay to fix it up. However, this is a much more expensive option as depending on the size of your pond, you do need a lot of clay. Um, another type of clay is called bentonite. Um, again, a natural substance, uh, substrate. Uh, but for this one, it does require specialist contractors. So you'd have to go out and look at who provides that uh, close to you. And then lastly, um, my favourite and if manageable, no liner. Um, if you have water holding soil, you might not need a liner at all, which would be great. If in doubt, you can test this by digging a test hole in your garden or community space or wherever this pond is going to go and check whether uh, it holds water over a period of time. If the soil is holding water, then this is really the best way to create a pond as it provides that natural substrate. However, lifespan is limited with um, uh, no liner and I think it's best to be mindful of any pollution runoff depending where you are situated. You know, if this is going near a road or, you know, on the edge of farmland where there's possible fertilizer and pesticide use, um, then that can really, really affect uh, natural ponds because obviously uh, the water table and the water running through that soil um, is hard to control. And step five, add the water. Um, it is really important not to use tap water at this stage. Um, I know it feels like you just want to get that pond filled and looking great and start, you know, encouraging wildlife to come and visit. Um, but uh, tap water has high levels of dissolved nutrients and is essentially too rich for the pond. If you are patient enough, waiting for rainwater to fill the pond is a great option. We're currently experiencing April showers, so this month would be great. Um, if not, collecting rainwater and rain butts to use later on is also a good option uh, particularly if you're doing a larger a larger pond then I would definitely recommend a, a water butt because you might be waiting a long time if you're just relying on rainfall also when you're filling up your pond um, keep an eye on any turf or soil that you've used to hold that liner down uh, you don't want this to kind of wash into the pond water as you're filling it up or to be submerged by the pond water either, as again, that would add too many nutrients to the pond um, and unfortunately start you off in a slightly bad situation. So, yeah, just double check as you're filling it up, make sure everything's secure and that you're confident as to what level you're going to be filling that pond up to. And then my favourite bit, step six, is add features. So you've sort of done that hard work of shaping it, digging it, filling it. Um, and this step is, in fact, optional, but can help to add secondary habits, uh, habitats and microhabitats to your pond area. So adding things like bricks, dead wood, large rogs and even a uh, hibernaculum can enhance the number of habitats available to other species, particularly amphibians. Um, an example of how to create one of those is on the right. Um, it's a great little diagram showing you um, that this creates sort of those dark and damp areas as refuge for different species. Uh, but make sure that you use pipes uh, to enable access in and out of those. Um, other features provide great hiding and nesting and breeding grounds. So you just start to sort of create that mosaic of microhabitats in a very small space. So I would definitely recommend this step, even though it is optional. And, and you can be quite creative with it. That picture on the left there, they've got some dead logs. They've got different types of pebbles. They've actually got some bare soil as well. Um, and they've started to sort of create that um, sort of terrestrial land uh, where you've got extra plants as well. So you can, yeah, you can be fun with it, uh, pick up materials, uh, use old bits of material that are in your garden or allotment and, and start to create those secondary habitats. Um, and it actually makes uh, your pond look a lot nicer in those first beginning steps as well. If you just leave it with the kind of pond liner and turf and little bits of sand, um, it can take a little bit of while to, to, to establish. So this is almost, you know, adding those extra features and, and making it look pleasing to the eye, as well as, you know, supporting lots of other species, particularly those amphibians and invertebrates.
At this point as well, I would also like to highlight uh, Joel Ashton, who has a great YouTube channel and a whole playlist on wildlife ponds and how to create them. Some are also time lapses of him digging and adding in liners to give you that kind of real world example of how this is done. He's got loads of examples of ponds that is built across the UK and he's got lots and lots of extra feature ideas um, you know ideas of what to add to the the side of your ponds and um, so it's really really good for, for inspiration so before you dive in I would definitely recommend watching some of his videos uh, some of the ponds you know are very very different some of them are very much garden ponds and some of them are in slightly wilder places so yeah good good to have a look at and see what suits you and in, in your situation and then step seven, wait for wildlife. Um, as mentioned above, there are a few things you can do to speed this process up by adding other substrate to the pond, like sand or gravel, gravel and other microhabitats. But in general, it is best to just watch and wait and see what happens. Um, I know it can be frustrating and you wanna go and plant and you wanna go and add different uh, plant species and maybe even introduce your own uh, frog spawn. Uh, but there are issues around that, particularly adding in things like frog spawn because you could be contaminating and bringing other diseases from uh, other ponds or other areas of, of the county. So it really is a case of watch and wait and just see what happens, see what establishes. You know, there could be already some great seeds, uh, you know, waiting to appear out of your soil. Uh, you might already have some of those species in your garden that will just, you know, colonise that new space. And it can be really exciting as well to keep a kind of log of what's happening um, and, and, you know, how your pond is developing. During our pond survey workshop on Tuesday, so yesterday, we pond dipped two scrapes. And I know some of you on, on the webinar were, were there for that. Um, these scrapes were dug 18 months ago. And we actually found a whole host of species such as mayfly larvae, caddisfly, a lesser boatman, dragonfly larvae and damselfly larvae to name a few. Um, and no actions were taken on that site to introduce wildlife to the scrapes, including plants or freshwater species. So it's great to see so much diversity in a newly established site and kind of um, highlights that just watching, waiting, seeing what happens is a good step forward. Here on the screen, though, you can see uh, a fully established pond, a kind of a graphic of that and something that you can aim for with highlights on some key features. Um, so, yeah, it's something to think about what you're aiming for so that you can then provide the best conditions for that. Um, and yeah, have an idea of, of what you should be looking for as as the years go by. And that is the the end of the, the sort of more practical steps part of the webinar. Um, and I now want to go through uh, some key concepts and add a little bit more detail to some of the things that I've briefly mentioned. A reminder also to add any questions from the steps process to the chat box for me to answer at the end of the session. I know a couple of people joined us uh, late, but this is going to be recorded so you can go back and have a look at those initial steps. So let me just now dive down into the key features and structures. Um, and if you do give your pond to a, a, a pond a, a chance to es establish, these various different features and habitats uh, will develop. So here on the screen, I've got a good example of that. So at the edge of your pond, you will begin to see marginal plants, which is a great habitat for invertebrate and, and a good breeding ground and nesting area. This gentle slope will also allow easy access for animals like hedgehogs, ensuring they can get out of the water. Some of those sort of more deeper ponds that might be in, you know, old sinks or kind of those plastic tubs that you can buy. Um, don't allow that kind of easy access in and out in that shallow water. So if you're creating your, your own pond, uh, definitely something to think about. It then moves down into the emergent plants, that kind of shallow area that I've chatted about before. Um, and these plants thrive in half submerged environments. So they're sort of half in, half out the water. If you've added other substrate like sand or gravel, this will add diversity. Um, and as we move slightly deeper into the other parts of the pond, you will then find submerged plants or floating leaved plants. If you haven't used a liner, as I suggested, you know, if you've got a soil that can hold the water, your pond will also most likely fluctuate in height, creating something called a drawdown zone. It's not on this diagram here because this one is for a liner. 
Um, but these are areas that are left bare when the water levels drop and they are perfect for specialised species and create a really good foraging area for birds. And, and these drawdown zones can also be a great seed bed for plants. So if you are doing it without a liner and you see that fluctuating water, those kind of bare muddy patches or bare sandy patches are really, really great. And they're called a, a drawdown zone. So something to look at and, and research if you are, are doing it that way. Um, and then I, just for clarity as well, I have this slightly more detailed map. I know it is a little bit small and the writing's hard to read, but I just wanted to show you one with some kind of clear idea of plant species. So your terrestrial plants, things like creeping bent, red valerian, devil's bit scabious and purple loose drife. Um, you could see those popping up in those areas. Really good to have on the kind of outside of your pond. The marginal plants, uh, this might include ragged robin, um, marsh pennywort, water mint, one of my favourites, smells be it really beautiful, soft rush, cuckoo flower, water forget-me-not, marsh marigold and marsh sink foil. There's sort of a, a crazy list of plants for the, for the marginal areas there. The emergent plants to look out for include things like yellow flag iris, water plantain and greater pond sedge. And then your submerged plants or floating plants include common pondweed, white water lily, common hornwort, water crowfoot and common starwort. And when going through that step by step guide, I did mention that it's best to wait and see uh, what wildlife arrives. And that does include plants as well. If you aren't using a liner, then I would definitely recommend not planting. However, if you are using a liner or simply want to speed up the process, then planting can be an option tentatively. And I would definitely recommend the plants that I've just said. Many of the plants listed um, can be found on the Freshwater Habitats website, as well as some of the Wildlife Trust websites. Um, so I'll send these through if you would like them. Uh, but the, the thing about planting is that management is really, really key um, because you're introducing plants. They can over dominate. Um, you've just kind of lifted the soil. You've created those bare patches. So it's very easy for plants to colonize these areas, particularly things like yellow flag iris. They can go a little bit crazy if you plant them straight away. If you do decide to plant and plants are becoming um, slightly dominant, then things like thinning the plants and cutting off the seeds heads can be a good way to manage this as the pond develops. But yeah, it's something to, to think about. Um, and it could be that if you've allowed your kind of pond to naturally develop, but you're not seeing some of those plants, you know, further down the line, then it could be a case of, of adding those later on. There is also a way that you can add them uh, without them necessarily spreading. Obviously, they'll still seed, but you can put them in their own little pots and, and then they're kind of allowed to be in situ without spreading too much. So it's just really about looking at your space, what works for you and also where you're doing, you know, uh, the pond. If it's in your own you know, back garden, perhaps it's, you know, not a problem to leave it and, and see what happens. But if it's in a community space that people are going to be visiting, then maybe uh, planting a few species might be something that you need to do. But just food for thought anyway. Also keep an eye out uh, for invasive or non-native species. Alien invaders is what some people like to call them. And I've just got four key ones on the screen there. So we've got New Zealand pygmy weed. Um, this can go crazy, you know, it, it grows and it grows and grows and it creates a really thick matting on top of ponds and other freshwater bodies. So it's something to keep an eye out for. You've also got parrot's feather. I think well named. It's sort of got really feathery leaves uh, that pop out on the surface. You've got water fen and floating pennywort. And it's more likely that people have heard of, of floating pennywort before. We do have instances of this uh, across Essex. So uh, they're the worst and most common. And they're just a visual uh, for you on the screen there. If found, as I said, they can rapidly overwhelm a pond and replace those kind of less vigorous native plants. So do remove them if you find them. And if you are unsure of any species popping up, iNaturalist is a great tool. Um, it's kind of like a plant ID app. You can take a picture of the species and upload it to the app. Um, it will give you sort of ID suggestions and you can pick what you think it might be. But if the suggested ID is incorrect, then an observer on the app can come along and correct it for you and you know, suggest another. So 
um, there is that kind of reliability on there. Um, but of course, another good way of working uh, um, out what they are, you know, books, looking at ID, field, water studies, council have some good like ID, um, sort of almost like maps that you can pull out. So yeah, definitely keep an eye on what's growing, um, especially when it's uh, invasive and non-native. There are also some common misconceptions to be mindful of. You know, what about fish? A lot of people ask me, um, you know, ponds must have ducks and fish. Why don't, you know, uh, the ponds that you've got in your booklets or on your website, um, why don't they have fish or ducks? And, and in the wild, uh, fish are definitely a natural part of wildlife in some ponds but in smaller ponds like the ones we're describing today they can overwhelm and over, do over dominate eating the smaller animals including frog and newt tadpoles and um, those things I'm sure a lot of you on this webinar today are hoping to encourage they also pollute the water and therefore filters are very often needed this is also the same problem with ducks so they're just two things to be really mindful of um, you know, it's it's often uh, the vision that people have of ponds that fish and and uh, ducks should be there, but that is not the case when we're looking at these kind of smaller wildlife ponds that are in gardens and allotments and that sort of thing. Uh, similarly, everyone also thinks ponds are only good, in good health when clear and completely free of mud. Um, falling leaves, dead wood, trees around the pond can be absolutely beneficial. They provide food, shelter, building materials and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, it's not a case of having absolutely nothing around your pond and, you know, no other uh, sort of features that could be adding to that pond in terms of leaf litter or mud. It's just really a case of keeping an eye out on that build up because too much silt can change the health of a pond, particularly if you haven't got a liner and um, that kind of silt uh, that builds up over time means that your pond uh, gets you know more shallow over time and eventually disappears which is why I said earlier that they're kind of uh, you know they're not infinite uh, when they're natural so there is a need for management if you want the pond to stay there and that kind of links back to a conversation that we had on our pond workshop yesterday uh, with Nikki who led the workshop our area conservation officer um, there is such a thing called ghost ponds, so they normally happen in sort of larger landscape areas, agricultural land, that sort of thing. Uh, but ghost ponds are ponds that once were, ponds that have either naturally disappeared over time because uh, they've silted up and, you know, got more and more shallow. Uh, they're not no longer near the water table and they, they dry out or that they're ponds that have been, have been filled in. So it's just something to be mindful of if you do have um, some shade, some tree and some, some leaf litter. Monitoring and surveying your newly established pond is also really important and that can be done through pond dipping. If you are at the in-person workshop, you now know how important and useful pond dipping is and it's not just for children. Um, the Field Studies Council, as I've said, have some really handy ID guards. I'm certainly not an expert and they can be really, really handy at identifying the larvae, which is, you know, a tricky, tricky stage to be identifying things at. Uh, but things like dragonfly and mayfly larvae are a great indicator that your pond is healthy. So it's just a really good way to kind of get in there, see what's happening. Is your pond developing in, in the way you want it to? Is it healthy? And, and pond dipping can be such a fun activity. You've just got to be careful that you don't disturb the area too much. And when you're sort of standing around the edge, you're not creating kind of slippage or, you know, pushing any of those uh, bits of soil or, or gravel in too far. Um, but here on the screen are some pictures uh, very kindly um, shared by Tracy Kins, who were at, was at the workshop today and I think is on the webinar with us today also. Um, but we saw, you know, lots of different species and you can see four already on the screen there, um, including a caddis fly water flea, lesser boatman and a dragonfly larvae as well. So, you know, it, it didn't use any fancy equipment, just a, a net, a tray. And then Tracy had a camera to take pictures of, of what we had found. And it was it was really exciting um, and something I'm hoping to do again in the future. But if you've got your own pond, definitely give it a go. Um, and yeah, it could be exciting. You never know. So what else to look out for? Um, this slide is just an idea and certainly not an exhaustive list of what 
could be welcomed if you create a wildlife pond. As I said, half the fun is working it out yourself. Um, and in some cases, popping in a trail camera can be a really good idea, maybe nearby. That can uh, show what potentially is using the pond, what's living around the pond, um, and how much of a resource it is uh, to the kind of you know, neighbouring gardens and, and other habitats in your area. But on the screen there, we've got newts. So uh, newts could be uh, coming to your pond. Uh, great crested newts is something you might find. Um, toads, uh, obviously everybody's familiar with toads and frogs. And it is often something really exciting. You know, you get them coming to visit and then you can see, you know, toad spawn and, and frog spawn. Frog spawn is the one that you uh, see that normally has kind of a clump clump of eggs almost, whereas toads is almost like a, a, a bracelet forming, a necklace forming, like a string uh, of eggs. So that's something to look out for, uh, really exciting to see. You also obviously got damselfly, they'll kind of fly across the surface, skim about um, and often can be seen on slightly sort of warmer days. You've then got the pond skater, they tend to arrive quite quickly, quite fascinating. They use the water tension to go around the surface of your pond. And then mayfly as well. If you watch the recent um, Wild Isles documentary uh, that David Attenborough was on, they had a great piece on, on mayflies and they are often synonymous with our talk streams, but you can see them on, on ponds as well. So something to look out for. Very exciting if you see them. And finally, if you are on the webinar today um, and don't have space for the pond creation I have just described, then no fear, there are other options. And I'm now going to just share a short video on how to install a smaller, more manageable pond in your garden in a slightly different, um, less intensive way of, of bringing that environment uh, to your space. Uh, this is also a really good activity for, for families. So yeah, take a listen and enjoy. Hey, hi everyone, my name is Jules Howard, I'm a wildlife writer and author and I have got the most special place in my heart for ponds. Ponds are incredible places for wildlife. Many invertebrates depend on them as temporary habitats and they provide a sort of stepping stone bridge into urban and suburban places. In general, the bigger the pond the better, but if you don't have the space, little ponds may also add value to wildlife. This is my kind of top tips, I suppose, to create a mini pond in your backyard space. One, something that holds water. I'm gonna use an old sink. Two, pond plants. Three, some bricks or stones. Four, some logs. Put your mini pond somewhere it'll get sun throughout the day. Next, add a step ladder for animals to get in and out of your pond. You'll also need a stepladder on the inside of your pond so that animals don't get trapped. To make it look a little bit more decorative, I've added some washed gravel to make a kind of beach. Next, fill it with rainwater. Tap water is okay, but tap water has more nutrients in, which might make your pond go really green and horrible further down the line, so avoid it if you can. Last but not least, pond plants. I've gone for Water Soldier, a nice floating leaf plant that offers a kind of multi-storey of opportunities for pond invertebrates. Make sure you swill your pond plants a bit in clean water so that you don't accidentally introduce exotic pond weeds. So it really is unbelievably easy to make a mini pond like this. Join in the 2019 Wild About Gardens campaign and add your pond to their online map. Then let me know how you get on. You can also ask me any pond questions you might have on Thursdays between 6 and 7 p.m. as I take over the Wildlife Trust Twitter feed. The hashtag you need is hashtag wildaboutponds. So I really hope you can join us. Um, I really look forward to hearing how your ponds go. I've been Jules Howard. Goodbye. Uh, that was just one example. Um, if you go to our website, there are plenty of other examples. That one was with a sink. 
Um, but if you go to the kind of actions at home space on our website and scroll down, there's lots of how to guides for other different types of smaller ponds that you can use to help. Um, so if you haven't got the, you know, a huge amount of space in your garden, they're definitely a, a great example. Um, our, you know, even just a small amount of water can be really, really beneficial to your garden and the wildlife uh, around. So I would definitely recommend um, looking at the various different examples. That video is also available on YouTube. And I just wanted to highlight something that he highlighted in the video. We do have some other helpful guides as well. So Wild About Gardens is a uh, massive campaign that happens every single year with RHS. And back in 2019, they did a specific one on ponds. This year, they've got one all about uh, lawns and allowing your lawn to grow. But you can still access all the information about ponds when that uh, campaign was launched back in 2019. And uh, again, there are some really good examples and hints and tips for you to look at. The other one that I would definitely recommend you having a look at is Creating Garden Ponds for Wildlife Guide from Freshwater Habitat. It's really, really in depth. Again, it goes through all the steps similarly to, to what I did today and really outlines uh, some of the things to think about. Um, even once your pond has been established, so it looks at kind of common problems, how to fix those problems. If you've got an algae problem, for example, or, you know, if you do need to repair the pond, how to do that. So I would definitely recommend having a look at those. I can always send through the link if that is easier. Um, but that brings us really now to our last section of the webinar, which is uh, questions. So, you know, if you have any questions, I haven't seen any pop up in the chat just yet. Um, but if you've got any questions about, you know, your ponds that you're creating or any problems that you might have already with a pond that you've created or any questions about the steps, do pop them in. Um, of course, though, you can uh, also send me an email later on. I know what it's like when you're at a webinar. I can't think of anything in the moment, but I'm sure things will pop out later or when you're actually creating it. And, and, and questions start to come up. I'll just give you a moment if you do have any questions to pop them in the chat. If that is everything then, um, I also wanted to highlight our next topic. We've obviously had our preserve ponds topic already. Um, and our next one is Survey for Success, and we have two in-person workshops for you to sign up to. Oh, I've just seen a, a comment come up. Green slimy stuff. Yeah, OK, so that is a common, common problem. Um, and it's often an algae that's covering the top of your pond. And there, you know, are a number of ways that you can that you can deal with this. The first thing is to just remove it. Um, I was having a chat with uh, somebody at the workshop yesterday and they use a sort of small stick, twiddle it around the stick and then lift it out of the pond. And they then keep it um, to the side of the pond for a little bit of time, just in case there are kind of insects on there um, and then see if it comes back. If it comes back, then there are a couple of other things that you can do. Uh, Monty Don recently um, suggested using black dye. Uh, which isn't a chemical, it doesn't affect the wildlife in the pond, but it stops the kind of reflection of the sun and the build up of that green algae. To get kind of more details on that, I would definitely recommend looking at Freshwater Habitat and their um, guide because it has kind of a list of what to do if you do get algae, that kind of green slimy stuff on top. I would also suggest dub just double checking and making it sure there are no kind of issues around invasives as well. So hopefully that's helpful in the meantime. If you want me to send uh, you the guide, Leanne, um, I can do that. Not a problem. Uh, let's see, any other questions? Uh, Jane, any particular plants for dragonflies? So as I said, I would definitely recommend not necessarily thinking about planting unless you have to. Uh, for dragonflies, generally speaking, it's those marginal plants that are really important and the taller grasses. Um, so they'll be using those to kind of sit on and, and bask on and to sort of mate on as well. So if you are kind of letting your pond naturally establish, it's about looking out for those. If they're missing, maybe adding them at a later date. Uh, but again, in those guides, there are some really good lists of some of those kind of longer grasses. Um, but, you know, soft rush, 
purple loose strife, that sort of thing, those kind of tall, long stemmed plants are fantastic to, to use. Excellent. Well, I'm glad the session has been enjoyable for, for everybody here today. I'm glad I could answer some questions as well in real time. Any more, I'm more than happy to, you know, carry on chatting here today. Or, of course, you're more than welcome to leave us um, and I can send you through the guide. As I said, this will be recorded so you can look back at it and, uh, yeah, have another watch. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for or for coming. If you are part of our Team Wilder projects, thank you very much for getting involved and contributing and, and taking that much needed action for wildlife. Thank you, guys.